to Mayas. I, I, I'm very good at confusing these things. Mayas it is. Oh, man. It is confusing. We were switching back and forth, and I mean, it makes perfect sense that we would continue to do that. We were just... We just decided to do it this way. It just, sometimes it's like that. So, some people went and went to sleep. I can tell they, they had little blankets back there. It was just, I love you, man. I do. What I, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to do ten and eleven, and we're going to do a kind of a, an abbreviated deal, and then we can go smoke some of those those cigarettes again, and then and then Chris will do his deal. We might actually finish up twenty five or thirty minutes early. Let me tell you an interesting phenomenon that I found worldwide, no matter where I go, is that I don't care how engaging you are, I don't care what it is that you're presenting. Physically, you can only sit so long. I mean, there's just this physical thing that goes on, and if your butt is skinny like mine, it's even shorter. You just can't. You just can't sit there that long. And so if, if we shorten this uh, 15 or 20 minutes, probably somebody, you may not say thank you, but your butt's already saying, thanks, pal. It is. <laughs> it's good. The, this, this um, in, in AA land worldwide, there's this phenomenon of, of, of doing step work one way or the other and completely ignoring steps 10, 11, and 12. I want to talk about 10 and 11 for just a minute. Chris is going to talk about 12. And, and we had to fight each other. Better? We had, to, we had to fight each other to do step 12 stuff. There's nothing in the world I'd rather talk about. It used to be that what, all I wanted to talk about is girls. And then... As I got older and girls got less interested in me, I sort of swip, switched that stuff around. And, and what I'm interested in now more than anything is talking about 12-step work. Because 12-step work is the, is the secret handshake. It's the most misunderstood and most abused part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, and Chris will, he'll do an okay job when he does it. And I, I'm only going to resent it a little bit that I don't get to present it. because I, I, So most of the time I do. And so... Um, but, but let's talk about this stuff, this 10 and 11. It, it, again, it's one of those things that when we, when we slide out from underneath the radar of sponsorship, most of the time the very first thing that goes south is 10 and 11 stuff. Um, 12 stuff just doesn't exist in most of the United States. They're, they're not even doing that work. But, but you would think that... They used to call them in the old days, they'd call them maintenance steps, and then later people started calling them uh, growth steps, and, and, and I agree with all of that. The, the problem is that we just have a lot of people that have decided and made various decisions that they're just not going to do it at all. And so what I want to talk about is just for just a couple of minutes, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the, the, um, the mechanics of it a little bit, but also try to connect up why this stuff connects and makes things so important for us to do what we're doing. Um, Of interest, when we started eight and nine a minute ago, the lead in to that step said, What? Now we need more action. There's the thing. The, the, the most reoccurring theme in the big book is action, followed by willingness and recovery. They keep talking about it over and over and over again. It, the, uh, AA was never uh, a, a program that you could just sit and sort of assimilate. You just don't soak it in. And yet we have a lot of people that think that if they just sit in enough meetings, they'll soak all this stuff up and it'll be okay. But you just, you just, can't, you just can't do it that way. If you, if you flip over to... Um, it's 84 in our text on the, on the uh, Step 10 stuff. And they start talking about things that we're supposed to do. And I'm just going to read one little piece of this and then we'll talk briefly about it. This thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. This is the only place, this is the only place in the big book where it gives us permission to work a step out of order. Your amends process is still going on. But there's, what they're saying is clearly... There's a lot of people that have come up with some weird ideas about this, but this is clearly saying that while we're clearing up this stuff in the past, while we're trying to make these amends, we're going to vigorously commence this way of life, this 10, 11, and 12. Now listen, guys, these are disciplines. These are, these are disciplines. You, you, I don't think any of us come to the table 
already with the skill set to do 10, 11, and 12. I just don't think it happens. I think this is something that you have to practice and you have to... to um, my natural tendency as a guy is to, uh, is to go downrange in AA ways until I get healthy feeling, until I, until I look in the mirror and I look a little healthier and I feel a little healthier and then I want to stop all action. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to be healthy right there. Well, the problem is, though, is that, is that the, the way that this works, we don't drift towards more health. It's just a God-given fact. I mean, we, what we do is, as we, if we stop doing what we're supposed to do, we drift the other direction. My concept for years, guys, was that everything spiritual in AA, it was the natural place I wanted to go. And so all I had to do was just stop, and I would slowly drift towards God. I would slowly drift towards all this other kind. And the reality was, it was exactly the opposite. The natural tendency for me is chaos. It's just pure chaos. And so I don't, I don't drift that way. I have to actively seek, swim, row a boat. I have to go that way in order to get it. It's the only way it works. And so they're, what they're doing is the, 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 the verbiage tells me that we're going to vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. Bill's not mincing the words. He's meaning that this is supposed to be real every day. We have entered the world of the Spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. I just, I just want the secret handshake, thank you. If you'll just give me the key to the men's room, I, I'll be okay. I don't, I don't... A lifetime? Really? I don't know if I want to do that. I just... And it, and it is troublesome sometimes when you think about it like that. But if you'll look at the, the payoff, is is huge. The payoff... Listen, as an... Ex, as an just an, uh, an experience thing... In looking at a, a landscape with thousands and thousands of drunks that I've watched do this work, it, when, you, when I see a man that's spiritually sound and I see a man that's, that's healthy, that has everything I want, they always practice an active 10 and 11 and are actively working in the discipline of step 12. Always. There are no exceptions to that. You show me a man, I don't care what his age is, you show me a guy who is floundering in AA who is struggling to make a, a go of things, and I'll show you a guy who has done some of the work and who has decided for whatever reason that he doesn't need to do those disciplines in 10 and 11. I don't need to, I don't need to talk to God. I don't need to talk to a sponsor about the things that I do that are crazy. I don't need to... Bill Wilson and these guys, they understood exactly where our head was. They understood exactly the nature of alcoholism, and, 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 and they just understood alcoholics. All of this stuff sprang from the early Christian church from the Oxford movement and part of their tenets was the stuff that we're talking about here. They knew it too. This is so important that we grasp this stuff. The, one of the greatest lines in the book, and we've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. It's like a postscript at the bottom of the, of the sentence. We've stopped fighting anything. For by this time, sanity will have returned. That's what it was all about, guys. That's what the whole thing was about. The mental obsession that Chris started the day with, this whole idea, everything came back to this. Once sanity returns, I can manage, I can, I can take care of things, I can deal with life. I don't have to be a victim to this craziness that is my head. You see? And, and that's why it's so, it, it's the coolest. So here's what it looks like. Um... They give us four directions for a 10th step deal. Now listen, 10th step is not confused with 11th step stuff. 10th step is done at the moment you step on somebody. During the day, when it happens, as it unfolds, we deal with it right then. This is not end of the day stuff. Okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of confusion it seems to be. It's pretty clear here, but within the fellowship, guys want to deal with their 10th step stuff at the 11th step stuff at the end of the day and the beginning of the day. The problem is, is that that confuses the issue and it puts too much on the end of the day plate. So let's look at this thing from the, from the perspective of what it was done. They ask us to do this in order. When these crop up, they didn't say if, it said when, they know it's going to crop up. We ask God at once to remove them. That was the great instruction. We ask God at once to remove them. Remember, he's running the show. We're not anymore. We fixed that at, at step three. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. Two, we discuss them with someone immediately. 
Three, we make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. And four, we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we could help, love, and tolerance of others is our code. Four specific, itemized directions on what to do when you have words with somebody. And so listen, it looks like this. If I'm at work, and I'm always at work, it just seems like I mean, from 4.30 in the morning until I go home or go to a meeting, I'm at work. And so most of the drama that happens in my life happens there. My wife is also my business partner, the smart one in the bunch, and, and she, she runs the place, and they just keep me there for sort of comic relief. And, and, and <laughs> these days I wonder why they keep me there at all. I, I, I used to be a fair bookbinder, but these days I just spend most of my time talking on the telephone to drunks and, and watching Londa work her ass off. But, the, the, but so, so she sits right across from me. And so this is, she's, this is what she sees during the day. And so I have some words with somebody. And it's like this. It's go, you, what, you, I don't need your, I don't need your, just go, ah, crank. And I slam the phone down. Now, we just had some dialogue there. Not Londa and I, but whoever it is on the other line have just had this dialogue. Now, I know what to do because I've been doing this a long time now. So what I do is I don't let go of the phone. It doesn't say that in the book, but I'm telling you, if I'm on the telephone, I don't let go of it. I just hold the phone. And so I say, God, please, 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 forgive me. I can't believe I did this again. And then I say, thank you, God. And then I dial Cliff Bishop's telephone number. And I say, Cliffy, you won't believe what I just did. He said, I bet you yelled at another customer, didn't you? And I went, yeah, how'd you know? And he said, well, the same thing happened twice last week too, remember? I go, yes, sir, I understand. He said, you know what to do? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And I hang up the phone. And then I pick it back up again. And I hit redial, call this guy back. And I called him back. And I go, no, 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 no don't, don't hang up. Don't hang up. Yeah, it, it is Myers. Yes, listen, I treated you shabbily. I, I got a lot on my plate. And you caught the brunt of it. Please forgive me. And he goes, okay. And then we finish our conversation sanely. And then I set the phone down. And then I let it go. Like this. And Londa's looking at me like this, smirking the whole time. She's just watching me like this. She goes, do you ever get tired of doing that? I go, you have no idea how tired I get of doing that same thing. But the discipline of doing it keeps me from getting this head that says that I have the right to talk to another man or another woman that way. I have no right to treat another individual that way. You see? And that kind of accountability, having to call Krusty Cliff and tell him what I did again, is just like... Let me, let me take this story and set it aside for a second. Let me tell you another part, the first part of this. The first part of this was, is that for years I didn't do any of that. None of that. And buddy, let me tell you something. So Cliff Bishop is talking to me one night after a meeting. He had been my sponsor for almost a year. And he said... I've been meaning to ask you this question. I said, yep. He said, don't you ever have unkind words with people? Don't you ever have fights with your wife? Or don't you ever have fights with customers or your employees? I went, yeah, of course I do. Why? You might want to read something. This 10-step stuff is on page 84. You might want to read that. And then he just walked out of the room. Listen, this is embarrassing for me to tell you this story, okay? Really, it is. I would rather tell you about my stories with barnyard animals than to tell you this story right here. So by this point in time, I'm now at seven, eight, eight or nine years into the, into the program. And, um, and so I go home, take out page 84, and I read it for what seems like the first time. Okay? I'm reading this thing, and as I read each one of those little directions, I go, Oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, no. And because it occurs to me, I'm supposed to be doing this the whole time, but nobody... I, I know that they've told me this. They're on the wall. I mean, I know what the steps look like. And yet, here's a piece of this thing that I had so easily evaded because I'm sober. You understand what I'm saying? The, the, remember, guys, there's a lot of decisions that we make in AA that we justify just because we haven't had a drink. And that's, there's, there's a lot of problems to that, guys, because we miss, sometimes we miss the very best that God had to offer that had nothing to do with alcoholism, that had nothing to do with the drama of drinking and stumbling over our, ourselves and getting goofy. That it didn't have anything to do with that. Sometimes the, the, just the areas of being able to clear up a wrecked past or be able to understand, be able to look at, at men and women in this fellowship like God might look at them. Lovely, seeing them for the first time. Not as, as jerks and bullies and dickheads, but as guys that were really important. 
You, you guys understand what I'm saying, kind of? It's just like, kind of, wow, this is an amazing deal. And so, um, um, if, you will, if you will practice these things, um, across the page there's this deal that says, every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. And then it says, these are thoughts which must go with us constantly. There's three, let's see, one, two, three, four places. I marked them. Four places that must is mentioned on page 85 in this text here. It may not be in your translation, but stop and think about this. How many times in our fellowship do we hear people go, there are no musts in AA? Excuse me? Slick? It's four times right there on that page. Let's do that, you see? It's just crazy. Moves us over into this area of, of, of step 11 stuff. I want to tell you a quick story, and it's, it's a, it illustrates this idea. Um, every man that I've ever sponsored that struggled, it always came back to this. It always came back to me trivializing the, the place that God plays in the center of our program. Um, and, and it may be because maybe there's, some, maybe there's some things that have crept up. Maybe God didn't do what I wanted him to do. Maybe I played, let's make a deal, God, and it didn't play out the way I wanted to. Maybe sometimes we get in here and we get all full of ourselves and then we get, we get kind of head up inside of the head and, and we blame God for it. And there's a million reasons why we drift off course. I'm not judging any of it because I think I've probably done every one of them, guys. Every one of them. But, but, but what I began to find later on was is that sometimes we start making life really tough going. We separated ourselves from the sunlight again, and for various reasons, um, we, we find ourselves in this situation where, um, where we're just not making any progress. It's just like we're back to, to kind of slugging through it. We're not drunk. We're not loaded. But, but it's just life is kind of taking on this, this general tough going kind of thing. And, and almost every time you can, you, can, you can bring this thing back around to a busted up relationship with your creator. You can bring it around to at some point in time where you very slowly but very assuredly pushed yourself away from God and his grace. And we see this stuff all the time. And it's so easy to do. It's the easiest thing in the world to do, especially if you're going to meetings in Dallas, Texas, where we don't talk about God, where, where a lot of groups, they I mean, you talk about getting shut down. I mean, you can talk about anything you want to. You can talk anything. But, man, you bring God into some of those meetings in Texas right now, and I'm telling you, they'll hand you your head. That's got no place in here. Oh, so we can't talk about the Creator. No. Okay. You see what I'm saying? But if that happens enough, sometimes it only happens once, and you'll go, well, okay, okay. We, we won't do that. Let me ask you a question. You guys and, guys and gals that have kids, what's one of the greatest experiences that you've ever had with your kids? One of the things that, that really caught me off guard one time was not was not that my kids would love me, was not that my kids would do... What was the coolest thought one time was that I could just simply be in the room with my kids. They could be playing video games or talking on the telephone or just being there. All I wanted to do was be there with them. And it was an amazing connection. And I think, guys, this is exactly the way God looks at this situation. If you want a relationship with God, what's the, where's the connect? If you want a relationship with God, spend some time with God. That's the only way I know to do it. I want, I want God to be my best friend. But I don't want to talk to Him. And I don't want to spend any time with Him. And I'd just as soon run my own game if I can. But I really want to be close to God. That's lip service at its ugliest. Because you don't get there that way, guys. I, I wish there was an easier way to do it. But in order, to, in order to draw closer to God, you have to be there and draw close to God yourself. You have to be able to spend some time with Him. And, and, so, and Bill and these guys understood it under the coaxing of, of Shoemaker and some of these spiritual giants that they were around in the day, some of these early members of the Oxford movement. They, they, they began to teach Bill... Uh, Bob already knew a lot of this stuff, but they began to teach him that if he wanted to develop a relationship, he was going to have to, 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 to put some effort into doing that. And so they came up with this idea that at the beginning of the day we could do some things and at the end of the day we could do some things and we could connect. We could take this day and make it smaller. We could take this, this experience and make it smaller into a piece that we could, we could have. In the third step, they, they're, 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 they talk about 
or in, in working with others, they talk about um, uh, we stood at the turning point. You remember that? Uh, guys, I think I'm convinced that we stand at the turning point every day. Every day when we get up, we have the decision to make whether or not we're going to pursue this thing or whether we're not going to pursue this thing. Whether God's going to be in the picture or whether we're just going to try to run on our own, our own, our own game. You see? And that's just, that's, just the, that's just the crazy thing like that. So the, 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 bef- almost exactly the same time that I got hooked up with Primary Purpose Group and those big, bunch of big book thumpers, I was not doing any 11-step disciplines and I wasn't doing any 10-step stuff, obviously. But, but I mean, I, I, never, I can't remember ever praying. I mean, I can't remember it even being a part of my, whole, of my deal. And we were, we were, I'll tell this story because it's kind of embarrassing for me, but it, it, it sort of connects it up on a real, real simple level, which I could understand. The, the, uh, that same men's conference where I made an ass out of myself with the little girls tutu thing, at that same men's conference, we were there one year, and Chris was there that year, Mark Houston was there that year, and there were two or three other guys, these were heroes of mine that were there at that table when we were sitting there. And so we're, we're having breakfast, and there's all these guys standing around here like this, and, and I said... I, I swear, I, I don't, it's not even funny when I say it now, but at the time, I thought I was being funny. And I said, you know, did you see those guys in the, in the, in the dorm this morning? There's like 16 or 17 guys sleeping in each dorm. And in the morning, these men would slip out, get on their knees, say a prayer, and go take a shower. And I'm judging them mercilessly. I think it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. These, these guys, these are wussies. Why would, why would a man do that? And I'm trying to sell this to these spiritual giants that are sitting at that table. <laughs> Well, it didn't go over real well. I mean, it, it, as you might expect, I'm saying, did you see those guys? And, and, and Chris kind of looks at me, and he's the first one to leave. He doesn't even say a word. He doesn't even react. He just, he just, he just took, took his tray and backed away, and, and, and pretty soon another guy got up, and nobody's saying anything. Everybody's talking, and these guys are looking straight ahead like I had just made the greatest mess of things and so in the end it's it's me and mark houston sitting right across from me like this and total it's dead quiet at the table and my face is beat red i know i've screwed up i'm not completely sure how i've screwed up yet but he's getting ready to tell me i know <laughs> and he's kind of looking at me and it's making me real uncomfortable i hate it when people stare at me and so he's looking at me and i finally just said what and he goes Myers, let me ask you a question. He said, do you believe that our text tells us how we are supposed to respond to God and that stuff? And I went, yeah. And he said, do you remember the part in the big book where it says that God is everything or he's nothing? And I went, yeah, I remember. And I was hoping that he wouldn't ask me the page because I couldn't remember if it was 52 or 53. And, but it didn't matter. And I just, I just, I went, yeah, I remember that. And he said, okay, so I, I just want to make sure that we're real clear about this. So I said, okay. And he said, God is either everything or he's nothing, and you just said he's everything. And I said, yep, that's what I said. Okay, he's everything. I said, yeah, that's what I just said. Now I'm getting irritated, you see, because I, I, I'm feeling jammed up. And so I said, yes, he's everything. He said, okay, i just just checking. Dead silence. I'm starting to sweat. I'm starting to feel real. Un- I'm looking around the room, and I'm starting to edge my tray toward the edge like I'm going to get up and leave. And he said, whoa, 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 hang on a second. Before you leave, let me ask you this question. If God's everything in your life, how much time did you spend with him today? I said, you mean today, like so far today? And he goes, yeah. And I went, well, none. He said, how about, how about yesterday? Well, the truth. And he goes, yeah, let's try that. Like that. And I'm just like, you have to know Mark to get this feeling like this. I mean, it's just like, he, I'm getting crucified here. I just feel horrible. And, and I go, okay, look, Mark, I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth is, I spend a couple of seconds a day with God, and it's usually in my truck when I'm backing out of my driveway. And he said, so, okay. All right, so I just want to make, and I'm going to paint the complete picture. So God is everything in your life, and you spend a couple of seconds with him when you're backing out of your driveway when the day is getting ready to slap you in the face. I'd say that's driven by fear, wouldn't you? And I said, you dang right. You bet. We agree on this. And he says, okay, good deal. And he picks his tray up, and he walks in, and he drops his tray off, and I'm just sitting at this table all by myself. There's 300 men in the room, and every table is packed except the one I'm sitting at. It was like I had just... Never mind. You, I, 
it's like I'm some kind of leper sitting there. And so I got up, I got up and I, and, I, and I took my tray in and I spent the rest of the day really, really reflecting on what he had said. It made some difference. So here's the story, guys. The next morning I get up like at 420. I don't want anybody to see me acting like a wussy. <laughs> And I, and I crept down out of that, be, that bunk bed, and I'm looking around like this, and I'm going, if anybody catches me, I'm ready to die now, God. And I get on my knees, the first time I've ever been on my knees in a prayer in my whole life. And I get on my knees, and I say this prayer, and I got up, and I walked to the bathroom, and I took a shower, and I'm sitting there like this. And guys, I'm telling you, it was like somebody had taken 220 volts and shoved it right at my rear end. I was absolutely electrified with the idea. For the first time, I felt like I had connected with God. And it was the craziest thing. And all I had to do was get my stupid ego and this crazy load of arrogance that I carried into this deal out of the way. You see what I'm saying? And it was this, 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 this absolutely... I mean, guys, I'm telling you, if I'd have read a thousand theology books, I would not have felt more in tune with... And believe me, I gotta, I'm going to make sure that everybody I talk to knows everything I know about this from now on. Because I'm telling... I know, I understand. It's one of those things that, it's like, it's like sex. You, people can tell you for years what sex is like until you have sex. And then you go, oh, they didn't tell me half of it. I mean, this was like the, the coolest. That's what prayer was like for me. When I began to connect it up and I began to realize that the, the way to connect with God was this very simple and yet profound thing. I mean, it was, just, it was just crazy. And everything in my program changed as a direct result of a relationship that, with God that we begin at that point and then just build and get better and better and better. And the God that I used to think was a jerk, I did. I began to go, holy cow, this is the coolest thing in the world. I can actually sit anytime I want to and have a chat with the creator of the universe? I mean, that's some pretty heady stuff, even for an old busted up drunk. I mean, this is kind of, wow, an amazing deal. Um, as your experience grows in this thing, usually the fly in the ointment is us in our arrogance, in our, in our whatever the deal is. I think that you're going to find the same experience that I did, that if you will simply submit to the process, that you will get better and better and better and better. Any of you guys remember the first time that you ever meditated and how uncomfortable and how stupid it felt? I mean, like, 10 seconds into it, I'm going, okay, that's enough. And I'm just crawling. I feel like i got bugs crawling on me like this. I'm hearing things. I'm just like, I'm, just, I'm coming apart. And I hear these guys talking about sitting for hours, and I'm going, they're stinking liars. They're just a bunch of liars because there's no way that a man can sit like that for very long. And so I tell Chris about it, and Chris said, just get you an egg timer and set it for 30 seconds tomorrow. And, I, and I'd set it for 30 seconds like this, and I'd go, 28, 29, 30, oh, oh, okay, like this. I mean, it was the most uncomfortable thing in the world like this because we're not taught to do that. It's like, it's like learning how to do anything else, any other discipline, whether you're playing a guitar or fixing a car or doing whatever it is like this. To learn how to sit still is an amazing, amazing thing. And, and that's what it came down to. In fact, I'll never forget the first time I sat and meditated for five whole minutes like this. I was... <laughs> I was like this. I was going, man, like this. I was patting myself on the back going like, you are the hottest guy in the world, Miles. I mean, you were just like, holy cow, how is this? An amazing deal. Just simply submit to the process. Don't judge it. Don't connect with it. Don't, don't, because you're your worst enemy. Just simply do it and watch what comes out of it. The coolest thing in the world. All right, let's go take a smoke break, and then we'll get Chris to come up, and he can answer all the questions that you were getting ready to ask me. Okay, I'm sorry. Hang on. Alan had another, another plan. Well, thank you to Myers for taking us through steps um, 9, 10, and, uh, and 11. Uh, what, one of the things I, I have experienced myself on, on those steps uh, is uh, that they, they are the things I, I use every day to keep my, my spiritual condition which is what allow me to, I believe, be a recovered alcoholic. Uh, and therefore, they are very important. I, I'm, I'm not a morning person, so I'm not always particularly good at like starting my day, reflecting on how that is going to be. But I always spend time before I go to sleep in the evening reflecting on how has my day been and what can I do to make it better the next day and is there anything I, I, I should make different? Uh, and I was also told this thing about 
go down on your knees and pray and that was a strange thing to be uh, be, be be told and the the first time i did it was when i did uh, step, step three and uh, for those who are here from Aarhus, uh, uh, a lot of you are doing that down in Wofrukirke uh, in the crypt. I don't know why I never got to be in the crypt, but my sponsor decided I should have a whole chapel to myself. Uh, I don't know if that was because my problems were big, but we, we had this whole chapel. And he left, and I was by myself, and I did it. I, and I did feel something in, uh, in doing it. And I do it now every day when, uh, when I reflect on my day. And it might not be a prayer. It might be what I call a conversation with, with my higher power. But it is something that helps. And the, the thing with being on my knees does make a whole big difference. When I tell my sponsees to do it, they give me this strange look. He is strange. But when they do it, they, they all come back and say, something happens when we do that. It's different. And, I mean, if that is all it takes to go down on your knees, I mean, that is not a big thing to do compared to everything else we have been uh, go going through. So it, it's like, do these things. Before we take a break and uh, move on to uh, 